Solar and battery is one of the most important investments that you'll make. And if your motivation behind going solar is to get the best payback period and rate of return, then here are the most important things that you need to consider before getting a solar or battery system installed at your house. The most important factor in getting the best payback period from a solar install is maximizing the surface area covered with photovoltaic cells. The most expensive parts of a solar installation are the labor, scaffolding and the inverter. Whether you're getting a standalone AC coupled inverter or a hybrid inverter built into a battery storage system. The solar panels themselves are not very expensive. To give you an example, if you're getting a 20 panel system installed by itself without a battery, the panels themselves typically only account for about 20% of the total installation cost of the solar system. If you're getting a solar and battery system, then the overall price of course will increase and the relative panel cost will only account for about 10% of the overall solar and battery cost. However, it's the solar panels, or more precisely the solar cells, that are the true money makers of the system, even more so than the battery. The panels are the components that generate and save the most money. So maximizing your return from solar is all about covering the largest area possible with photovoltaic cells on the roofs that you're looking to put solar on. Covering the largest area possible may not necessarily mean as many panels as possible because you may find that you can get a higher kilowatt peak on the roof by using a smaller number of larger panels, which in turn increases generation while cutting costs. When Spirit Energy designs a solar and battery system, one of the things we spend a lot of time on is looking at how we can get the highest kilowatt peak from the client's roof space. We'll usually look at three different sizes of panel. Standard 470 watt panels, then larger 510 watt panels, and finally jumbo 625 watt panels. We'll very often find that by doing this and checking every different configuration and layout of panels, then we can get a higher kilowatt peak out of the roof and therefore achieve a better return for our clients. If you're getting solar, it's really important to work with an installer that will look at using different configuration of panel types and panel layouts to see which combination will get the highest kilowatt peak out of the roof and therefore the best return. See our video on jumbo solar panels to learn about three cases where we managed to achieve a higher return for our clients by using larger panels. Jumbo panels are also cheaper overall because they have a lower cost per kilowatt peak and you need less panels, thus enabling you to get a higher kilowatt peak from the roof while lowering the overall system cost. This is one of the reasons why it's also really important to get multiple quotes and to make sure that you get a quote from a local solar specialist as well as a national installer. National solar installers will very often buy panels in bulk in order to cut costs and maximize their economies of scale. This means that while they may get a lower installation price, they likely won't be able to get as good a rate of return as a local specialist because they don't have the flexibility to make the most of your available roof space. Solar is not all about getting the cheapest price. And if your local specialist can get even an extra five to 10% out of your roof space through intelligent system design, then that's well worth paying more for because that five or 10% will make a huge difference over 25 years and save you a lot more than your initial additional outlay. A point to make is that all black panels tend to cost a tad more and be slightly less efficient than panels that aren't all black. So if you're not concerned about the panels being all black, then it's worth asking your installer not to use all black panels, as many companies will just specify those as standard, assuming that you're looking for them. But if you're not looking for them, then you can probably get a high kilowatt peak for lower cost. On to battery storage, and this is maybe a slightly controversial one, but my recommendation for those looking for the best return and payback period would be not to oversize your battery storage system, and if anything, to slightly undersize it. Battery storage is very expensive and batteries pay for themselves by storing cheap electricity, whether that be from the grid during off peak times or from a solar system, and then discharging that electricity to the house or building to offset a higher rate of electricity that would otherwise have been imported from the grid, or by discharging excess electricity that's not going to be used in the house to the grid for a high export rate. So why do I caution against oversizing the battery if you're looking to maximize your payback period? Well, because for batteries to pay for themselves within an attractive time frame with a 12% or better rate of return, you want them to be fully cycling at least once per day and discharging electricity into the house, not the grid. 
If you oversize your battery system to be larger than your house's electricity consumption during the peak rate window of your energy tariff, then the battery is not going to be cycling fully every day, and you may end up with a certain percentage of the battery capacity that's not being cycled or feeding back to the grid, and therefore not paying for itself so quickly. And not just not paying for itself, but also dragging down the return that you're getting on the storage capacity that is cycling regularly and that is paying for itself. Of course, this equation will change if you see your electricity consumption increasing in the near future, and it might be prudent to buy a larger battery system in anticipation of that increased consumption. Now, you may say, well, I can just export the rest to the grid and still get a decent return. And that's true. However, the best savings are going to come from you charging up from excess solar and then using that electricity in the house, not sending it back to the grid. You're going to make more by discharging the battery to the house to offset the import cost of electricity than you are by discharging the battery to the grid for a less lucrative export rate. So if you want to maximize payback period, you should size the battery to make sure that it is ideally fully charging and discharging to the house in the winter and in summer. Now you may also be thinking, well, looking at current tariffs and export rates, it can actually make sense to export to the grid instead of using electricity in the house. And that's true. In some cases, it does make sense to export to the grid at the moment. However, battery storage is a 15 year plus investment. So it's important to consider whether these high export rates may change over the lifetime of the investment. To get some insight on that, I'd recommend watching Gary's video on the future of solar energy exporting. It's a really, really interesting video that looks at the Californian and Australian energy markets, which are a few years ahead of the UK market in terms of solar uptake, and makes a prediction on how solar export rates in the UK will change over the next few years, and possibly go the way that the Australian and the Californian markets have gone. Gary's analysis shows that over the next few years, we can probably expect the UK energy stack to become so saturated with renewables during the day that there may be times where the electricity suppliers do not need and do not want to pay for your exported electricity. Now, the argument then would be to get more storage for the purpose of storing your own solar for self-consumption. However, I'd probably look to add on more storage even when this happens further down the line instead of oversizing your system now in anticipation of this situation in the future. So we'll often recommend that our clients install a slightly undersized system to begin with and then wait to get a year or so's worth of real world data as to how the system is performing to decide if additional storage is a prudent investment. You should also be careful with how you size the inverter. And again, your installer should advise on this. With certain inverters, you can oversize them without issue. And with other inverters, you'll want to slightly undersize them. Ultimately, it depends on your inverter's MPPT voltage range, efficiency curve, and ability to be throttled down in the event of a DNO restriction. So speak to your installer about what is the best way to size the inverter in your chosen system and why. It's probably worth asking the same question to multiple installers to see what answers they give and make sure that you're getting a range of feedback to make an informed decision on. In general, you do want to DC couple your system, as this means that you can save on inverter costs during the initial installation by only needing one inverter, and you'll also get a more efficient system. If you AC couple, then the electricity needs to be inverted for use in the house, then any excess needs to be inverted again to be stored in the battery, and then inverted again when discharged to the house. This is very inefficient and will result in large round trip losses that will add up over the years. If you DC couple, then the current only needs to be inverted once and it's more efficient. Before I continue, if you're within two hours of Reading, please do get in touch with Spirit Energy and either myself or my colleagues will give you a bespoke technical quotation that is tailored to your needs and maximizes the return that you're getting from your solar and battery. Do check out the case study video series that we made, which runs through an entire Spirit Energy install from point of inquiry to the design, survey and installation to see what you get when you request a quote with us and the work that we put into optimizing the return that our clients get from their solar and battery installations. The next thing to consider are your ongoing costs over the lifetime of the system and why it's important to choose reliable, tried and tested products that have stood the test of time and are designed and manufactured by companies that are established within the industry and likely to be around to honor the warranty should anything go wrong. 
You also want to design the system in such a way that any parts that do need to be replaced can be swapped easily without much expense. For this reason, I'd be very careful when choosing any roof level electronics like optimizers or microinverters. They do usually come with strong 25 year warranties. However, the warranty typically only covers the cost of the unit itself with a small contribution towards replacement cost. The actual cost of replacing a faulty unit tends to be much higher and can likely cost well over 500 pounds depending on the complexity and logistics of the replacement. The manufacturers do quote low failure rates, however at the end of the day you're still installing complicated electronics and inverter technology on your roof, and that technology has to withstand the sporadic UK weather for 25 years. It's not a risk that we'd recommend taking, and while increased savings is not the only selling point to this technology, should any of the devices fail, any additional financial benefits that you may have gained as a result of the better shade mitigation technology will almost certainly be lost to the cost of replacement. And should any fail, you'll likely end up with a worse return from the system than you would have gotten if you didn't employ this advanced technology in the first place. Another thing that I'd be careful with is buying a hot water diverter that is designed to take advantage of excess solar generation that would otherwise have been exported to the grid. If you have a well-sized battery system, then for the majority of the year that's likely going to hoover up any excess solar generation and there won't be much excess left for your diverter to channel into the immersion heater, apart from maybe in summer when your solar system is generating at full whack. These diverters do make a lot of sense if you don't have a battery storage system, and our head of sales, Mark, has an eddy installed at his house for this reason. However, we'd caution against our clients installing one if they are also getting a large battery storage system. Ultimately, it depends on how much export there is expected to be throughout the year. So go through the modeling that your installer has provided in detail and look at the seasonal breakdown to see how much export there is expected to be throughout the year and when the diverter will actually be used. These hot water diverters are designed to offset your gas usage by diverting electricity to the immersion. However, if you're on a tariff with very beneficial export rates, then it's likely more financially prudent to just export the excess electricity to the grid especially when your export rate is higher than your gas rate. The point on using established, reliable technologies also holds true for the installer that you choose. We always recommend choosing an installer that's been installing solar and battery systems for over five years and has a strong balance sheet and company's house profile, as well as a dedicated support team. Preferably, you want to be using a local company that employs in-house local staff instead of subcontracting and whose business relies on referrals and a good reputation within the local community. Before proceeding with an install, you should certainly check out the reviews, financial position and reputation of the company and its directors. We get a lot of calls from people that have received poor quality installs that can't get assistance from the original installer because they've either closed up shop or gone out of business in the time since installation. This happened a lot towards the end of 2024 when the market became a lot more competitive and some installers were struggling to win business and having to lower prices and cut margins to an unsustainable level. We also see this happen occasionally with those that get an installation under the Solar Together scheme. And do check out my video on Solar Together if you're considering an install with your council's solar scheme. Something that you can also do to improve your electricity savings is plan around your solar generation. If you know that your system will likely be generating excess during the summer months, then you may want to set your washing machine and dishwasher to run during the time when your system is generating more than your house can consume. This isn't hard to do and it's an easy change that can add up over the years in terms of saving. Then when the solar generation starts to diminish in the autumn and winter months, you can change your appliances to run off-peak and use cheap rate off-peak electricity instead. For those that really want to optimize savings, you could also swap tariffs seasonally as well. A tariff that is more beneficial if you have excess solar generation like Octopus Flux may benefit you more in summer when the solar is generating more, and you can then swap to a tariff that is pro-battery or pro-heat pump in the winter like Cozy Octopus if you're really looking to eke out the highest return from your system. 
If you have an EV and are regularly charging that because you're doing a lot of miles, then really that EV factor is going to trump anything else. And the most important variable in saving you money is going to be getting the best off-peak tariff rate through which to charge your EV. It's worth doing a bit of research into the different tariffs available and which is best for your setup when you're getting the solar and battery system fitted. If you think that you'll want to increase the system capacity in future, then you want to choose a system that allows you to do this easily and cost effectively. There's a good chance that you'll want to increase your battery storage if your house's on-site consumption increases due to a heat pump or due to the property incorporating more electrical appliances or going off gas. If this is the case, then you need to look at a system that allows you to add additional DC battery storage. The SIG Energy SIG and Store, Tesla Powerwall 3 and Give Energy Home Battery Systems all allow you to add on DC storage very easily. And take a look at our videos comparing these systems at the link in the description. There's also a point to be made about what to do if you get a DNO restriction. If you do get restricted by the DNO, then you might want to choose a system that allows you to easily upgrade the inverter without incurring any additional cost or changing any hardware should your DNO capacity increase in the future as a result of your local grid infrastructure being upgraded. Check out our video which talks through that in more detail and the type of system to go for if you do get limited by the DNO. You should also check to see if there are any grants available at the time you're getting solar or battery. At the time of writing this video, the main government incentive is the fact that solar and battery installs are VAT free. However, there are also incentives from mortgage providers such as Barclays, Nationwide, Lloyds and Halifax. Most of these will give you up to £1,000 cash back if you install a solar and or battery system. You can also get access to green mortgages if you install renewables at your property and raise your EPC rating. See our video on that to learn more and see what grants you may be eligible for as well. This is a slightly odd one. However, if you have a big south, east or west facing wall space, then it's certainly worth looking at wall mounted solar panels. These are very cost effective as they're cheap to install and only generate around 29 to 38% less than the equivalent roof mounted system would generate. See our videos on that to learn more, as well as an example case study of an 18 panel wall mounted system that we recently installed for a homeowner in Buckinghamshire. The other benefits are that wall mounted panels can actually generate more throughout the winter months than roof mounted panels, as the lightweights hit the panel at a more optimal angle when the sun is lower in the sky in winter. Wall mounted panels are also far easier to clean and don't get covered in snow, and they're also more cost effective and cheaper to install as well. Don't hesitate to reach out to us for a quote if you'd like some wall mounted panels. Lastly, if you're re-roofing, then tie in the panel install with your roof works. As well as huge savings on scaffolding, you can also use an in-roof mounting system where the panels sit in trays and replace the tiles. This tends to look better and also helps you to save on tile costs and share other costs like the scaffolding and the roof work. The downside is that you have less flexibility with panel choices and panel layout due to the limitations of the mounting system. So if your motivation is purely financial and you just want to get the best payback period, then it's important to weigh up the cost benefit of going in roof versus going on roof. Again, you need to make sure that you choose an installer that is happy to spend time designing for and running through the different options with you in detail to help you make the right decision as to what system is best for your house and your individual circumstances. Thanks for watching and please do ask me any questions. Please do reach out to Spirit Energy via our website or give us a call and we'll be happy to talk you through the various options and provide any quotations and design work to help you work out what system is best for you.